Have you been to Jesus for his cleansing power? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Do you know the freedom that the Lord provides? Oh, come and drink from this fountain of life. Dance in this water, know his delight. See streams of mercy that never run dry. Come to this fountain, drink from this fountain of life. This fountain of life. This fountain of life. So throw off your worries, give him all your cares. Come and leave your shame here at the Savior's cross. He's the only answer for the load you bear. Have you been to the water? Have you been to the water? Go come and drink from this fountain of life. Dance in this water. Know his delight, see streams of mercy that never run dry. Come to this fountain, drink from this fountain of life. This fountain of life. This fountain of life. This fountain of life. Wrapped in my grave clothes, now they're untied. I was more dead than Lazarus, he brought me to life. Now I know resurrection, death has no stain. I ran to the water, I drank from the water. I was wrapped in my grave clothes, now they're untied. I was more dead than Lazarus, he brought me to life. Now I know resurrection. Death has no sting. I ran to the water. I drank from the water. Oh, come and drink from this fountain of life. Dance in this water. Know his delight. See streams of mercy that never run dry. Come to this fountain. Drink from this fountain. Oh, come and drink from this fountain of life. Dance in the spawn, know his delight. See streams of mercy that never run dry. Come to this fountain, drink from this fountain of life. 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 Amen. We send our greetings to you today. And thank you for joining us, especially if you're new. We want to welcome you and say thank you for joining us here at the river digitally, but we welcome you and are glad to see you this morning. Each week, we like to present a spoken liturgy uh, every Sunday, and this is an old tradition of the church, and we'll do that now with this video. Lord, you have called your people to follow you from all nations, all tongues, all cultures, and all creeds. We are your people. Send us where you will. Use us how you will. You have gathered us together among the four winds. Unite us by your grace. Pour out your spirit upon us. We long to speak truth, see holy visions, and dream dreams of your kingdom. We pray for our brothers and sisters of the world we lift up our neighbors, both near and far. May they find peace and protection. In you, 
May they be free from fear, war, injustice, and oppression. May your spirit rest on all your people. Place in us the desire to serve so that we might see your glory and bring every person to love, to life, and to flourishing. For only in you do we find our being, our calling, ourselves. May the Spirit rest on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we just ask that you would pour out your fire on our hearts, that you would pour out your fire in our spirits, that you would use us as a community at the river to be a blessing to those around us, to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our coworkers, and those we interact with. Father, we ask that your healing would spread out over our communities and over our nation, over, uh, over our nation, Lord, that, um, that you would bring truth and clarity in this time of crisis and that your salvation would be all the more appealing in this time. Father, let us feel the urgency of expressing uh, and testifying the gospel to the people around us at this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 When I walk through a valley I am not afraid When I'm lost in the shadow Still my path is straight You are beside me You guide me for the sake of your name The King of Love, my Shepherd is. Nothing I lack if I am here. In any affliction, a table is set. Perfume and oil of you Anoint my head You lead me by a stream And I am at rest The king of love My shepherd is Nothing I lack The King of Love will be with me all the days that I live. When I walk through a valley, I am not afraid. When I'm lost in the shadow, still my path is straight. You are beside me, you guide me for the sake of your name. The King of Love, my shepherd is nothing I like.
Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. 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 Amen. One of the things we value here at the river is sharing our stories. And we try to do that regularly and just get inside of where each of us are in our journey. And we'll do that today with Brian and this video. My name is Brian Ferrati, and Brad asked me to share a little bit about my journey in being more aware of systematic racism around us. And so how did this happen for me? Um, I would say that my eyes have been increasingly awakened over these past few weeks. And honestly, that's embarrassing to say that things that I see now, um, I hadn't seen prior to that. One of the biggest factors in this is that recently, um, an organization that I work with, uh, the CEO is a black man. Yeah. And we had a board meeting at the beginning of June. And the okay. board chair asked everyone to go around and share how uh, recent events have been impacting them. And when it came time for the CEO to share, he said, you know, I've reached this incredible point in my career where I'm leading uh, a very prestigious organization. I sit here in this boardroom and I have the respect of everyone in the room, um, but there's not a day that goes by that I don't feel the burden of being a black man in America. And he said, when I drive around town, I am George Floyd. And he asked us all, he said, I know everyone wants to do something. So I ask you to share with your friends that your friend has been deeply hurt and impacted by these events. And then he said, what we're asking really is just for the recognition of inalienable rights that were bestowed on us by our creator. That conversation uh, combined with uh, a conversation with someone that lives in my neighborhood, um, a black family lives in my neighborhood sharing about their experience jogging in the neighborhood. The feelings they have leaving their house or sitting in their living room in my neighborhood have really impacted me and opened my eyes to things that I did not see previously and did not see clearly. I was reflecting back on the riots um, in 1992 in Los Angeles, <clears throat> and I was finishing up college at that time. So a lot of time has passed. And what really struck me is how little has changed. And I have um, been believing two lies about that. One uh, is that things are getting better. And the second is that it's not around here. Uh, the systematic racism exists elsewhere, uh, but not in the liberal Bay Area. And my perspective has completely changed on those two lies. And I've been reflecting on Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter uh, from the Birmingham jail because it was a letter uh, of correction to white church leaders during that time. And he said, we have to repent in this generation, not merely of the vitriolic words and actions of bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. We must come to see human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and persistent work of people willing to be coworkers with God and without this hard work time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. So I've been reflecting on how can I be a coworker of God in advocating for racial justice? How can I be a coworker for God in being an ally? And how can I walk humbly with God and learn about things uh, that my eyes are still close to? So that's uh, my journey. Hey, greetings to you all, um, especially those of you joining us for the first time. So they finally did it. They made Hamilton available to the masses. And uh, I had the chance to see it a few years ago in the theater, but uh, I was so excited to watch it again. Uh, and so the other night as I was queuing it up on Disney+, Plus, I was struck by the description. It said that Hamilton is the story of America then, told by America now. If you haven't seen it, uh, it's basically every major character is played by a person of color, 
and it makes some very pointed social commentary about the experience of being an immigrant in the United States. And it draws on the evolution of hip hop. It's really quite a masterpiece. Uh, you've got to see it. Um, but as I was watching it this time around, I just could not shake the feeling of how different this 4th of July felt. I don't know about you, but I experienced this whole weekend um, as to be quite sobering. And I felt the tension of what it means to both celebrate the birth of a nation, which gives us the freedom to critique it, with the feeling of just being overwhelmed by it, how badly and how obviously our nation needs critique. And so in a sense, that's the journey we've been on together uh, these past few Sundays We've been exploring what it means to be a community of prophetic people, one that confronts both the problems within us as individuals and within us as a society. Before we get going this morning, I actually want to let you know about an opportunity that allows us to stretch our muscles and exercise a little bit of that second category, um, leaning into what's happening in our society. The River will be hosting and co-sponsoring a, what's called a listening circle. It will be on Zoom, and it's going to be a dialogue on the topic of public safety and police accountability. And it's not a place uh, to debate. It's not a place to instruct or be instructed, but rather a place to listen, to share, and to be heard, wherever you might be coming from um, on this conversation. The event's going to be virtual, and it's going to happen on Sunday, July 12th from 6 to 8 p.m., you can, uh, we need you to sign up ahead of time online. You can do so by following the link on your screen. And I want to encourage all of us to participate as a way of, of practicing and stretching our capacity to be prophetic people who engage our society. With that, let's turn our attention to the word for today. Uh, if you've been journeying with us on Sundays, we've been having a conversation about what does it mean and what does it take to create openness in our lives the past two weeks, what we've been exhorted to open our eyes, to see the injustices and the realities of our fallen world. And then last week, we were exhorted to open our hearts, to resist defensiveness and pride, and to embrace surrender and engage the stories of others. Today, I want to talk about what it means to open our hands, especially as it pertains to bearing the cost of pursuing justice. Now, as we come back to the text, the book of Philemon, I have to confess I do so with a lot of fear and trembling. Not because the word is especially challenging or difficult to face today, but more because of who I am and who I represent as a white man in my handling of the text of Philemon. You see, white leaders throughout our history have a very troubled past with the book of Philemon. For example, it is the case that at least through the end of the 19th century, many white American spiritual leaders relied on this short letter as their favorite proof text for justifying slavery. The logic being, if Paul commanded the slave Onesimus to be sent back to his master Philemon, well, as should we. Or consider this, referring to a sermon he gave to before a, a congregation of slaves in 1833, white Presbyterian minister Charles Colcock Jones recalls, I was preaching to a large congregation on the epistle to Philemon, and when I insisted upon fidelity and obedience as Christian virtues in servants and upon the authority of Paul, condemned the practice of running away, uh, referring to the Fugitive Slave Act, of course, one half of my audience deliberately got up and walked away themselves, and those that remained looked anything but satisfied either with the preacher or his doctrine. Is it any wonder why his black slave congregation would react the way they did? This incident reveals that African Americans enslaved in America did not and could not accept the word of God as, as the word of God, any scripture or interpretation that could be used to uphold their oppression. A voice that would later emerge and would amplify this protest against such disturbing distortions of Scripture is the great 19th century abolitionist Frederick Douglass. He says, They have declared that Paul's epistle to Philemon is a full proof for the enactment of that hell black fugitive slave bill, which has desolated my people for the last 10 years in that country. 
They have declared that the Bible sanctions slavery. What do we do in such a case? What do you do when you are told by the slaveholders of America that the Bible sanctions slavery? Do you go and throw your Bible into the fire? Do you sing out no union with the Bible? Do you declare that a thing is bad because it has been misused, abused, and made a bad use of? Do you throw it away on that account? No, you press it to your bosom all the more closely. You read it all the more diligently, and you prove from its pages that it is on the side of liberty and not on the side of slavery. And so I stand here today longing to heed Douglas's call to read from the side of liberty. But I can't even begin to do so without first reckoning with, taking ownership, and repenting of the repugnant actions of my white ancestors. I am ashamed, and I want to publicly confess and renounce their abuse of power, education, and spiritual authority in the name of white supremacy. And this is not only a problem of the past. White evangelicalism's failure to preach, engage, and teach the letter of Philemon as a message of liberation for us today is a form of its own injustice, albeit one of silence and complicity. One theologian put it this way, the letter Philemon is itself a marginalized book, meaning we don't teach it, we don't we're not as familiar with it. And that is sad because Philemon provides a marginalized voice, the voice of a slave who stands silently as this letter is read. And so before I even open our text today, I want to begin in a posture of repentance and confession. Jamar Tisby, a black historian and pastor, says that there can be no repentance without confession, and there can be no confession without truth. The truth is that white Christianity has abused this precious letter of liberation, which frankly is just the tip of the iceberg for other problems of white supremacy in the American church. To all you who are out there, who are people of color, I want to publicly confess, repent, and apologize for all of the ways, both historical and contemporary, that you have been marginalized by myself or people like me. It is sin, it is wrong, and it must be acknowledged if we are to ever heal and become the prophetic people that God has called us to be. Now, I acknowledge that this does not undo the damage done, and nor does it mean we can just move on or move forward. And in fact, I'm so acutely aware, aware of how little and how too late this might be for some of us that I've been wrestling all week with how to come to the text of Philemon and preach to you all this morning. And so here's what I want to do. In our remaining time, I briefly want to amplify the voices of several black theologians and scholars whose non-white readings from the margins will stretch and challenge our normative interpretations or applications of Philemon. And if there is an invitation from the text itself to open our hands and bear the cost of justice, then submitting my voice and my leadership feels like a parable of sorts for me, a way of opening my hands. I invite us all to come and to sit and to open ourselves to their message. A familiar summary of Philemon, one that we've been sitting in the, fast, the past few weeks, could be summarized like this. Philemon is a wealthy Christian who lives in Colossa, and he has, like many wealthy Christians at that time and wealthy Roman citizens, he has slaves. And one of his slaves, Onesimus, a conflict emerges between them, and Onesimus runs away. While on his escape, he encounters Paul, who's in prison. Paul meets him, takes him under his wing, and leads him to faith in Jesus, and then he feels compelled to send Onesimus back to his master, Philemon. Here's the interpretive thrust. He sends him back not because it's the right thing to do under Roman law, but because Paul sees it as an opportunity to subvert the system and gut it from the inside out by sending him back not as a slave, but as a brother. Now, we might wonder... Why has this short story about a slave so long ago been received by the church into its divine uh, canon of Scripture? In other words, what value does it offer? 
Well, Dr. Margaret Wilkerson, a longtime UC Berkeley professor, go Cal, makes the case that it has tremendous value when applied to the process of restoration between divided peoples. She, like us, affirms the basic liberationist idea that we've been exploring, which is that Paul is subverting an evil human system by redesigning a new social order built around a quality of famil familial relationships in the kingdom. Recall that verse 16 says that Philemon is to receive Onesimus no longer as a slave, but as a brother. But what I appreciate about Wilk Wilkerson is that she doesn't stop there. She envisions the moment when Onesimus and Philemon finally first speak. Can you imagine that moment? Imagine for Philemon the anger, the betrayal, the loss of reputation he must be feeling. That's hard. But imagine for Onesimus the fear, the anguish of being sent back, the unknowing or the anxiety about what is Philemon going to do with his life. You see, Philemon is being exhorted to do something publicly in front of his whole household and his whole church, which is to not only free Onesimus, but to stay in relationship with him as a brother. Wilkerson is getting to the true human psychological and emotional dissonance of this moment. She says that Philemon must return psychologically and imaginatively to the time when he enslaved Onesimus in order to understand the full impact and implications that his actions had on Onesimus' spiritual and physical being, but also the effect on his own psyche. Do you see what she is saying? Philemon cannot, literally cannot participate in the work of restorative justice until he first confronts his own participation in a sinful system. This is a word for some of us today. If you are located like Philemon in the seat of power and privilege, opening your hands means looking at them and reckoning with what they've done. Have you begun the hard, historical, spiritual, and psychological work of reckoning with our collective past? And I want to urge us to resist the temptation of American individualism, which makes us want to divorce ourselves from the sins of past generations. This work for Philemon was costly. If he were to truly re receive Onesimus as a brother, he would have to A, relinquish any pre-existing views that he holds about justice. In this case, that he can punish and then restore uh, Onesimus back to slavery. But he also, B, must absorb social ostracism from his broader community. How are you doing with that these days? What pre-existing views are you needing to surrender? Now, I'm speaking to those of us that primarily seat in, sit in the seat of majority culture, which is in our context, white or maybe Asian American. What would it mean for us? What would it mean for you to surrender your views around policy reform and to like things like defunding the police and to take an inherent posture of support instead of a posture of suspicion? And what social ostracism are you willing to absorb so that our brothers and sisters of color don't have to? Do you grow weary of heated Facebook conversations or challenging conversations with extended family? Well, friends, this is our cost to bear. Don't grow weary of doing good. And if this is Philemon's cost, what is it that must, um, Onesimus must bear? Well, a traditional reading of Philemon sings the tune of emancipation. We assume that Philemon is faithful to Paul and that he frees Onesimus. And there is actually good historical evidence for this. Uh, early church history records a certain Onesimus who later becomes the bishop of Ephesus. But black theologian Demetrius Williams makes a disturbingly simple observation that challenges this view of freedom, and that is this. Paul sends Onesimus back. According to Williams, if Onesimus were truly a freed man, he would not have been sent anywhere by anyone. This brutal point shows how quick we are to glance over the experience of Onesimus himself, cherishing the moral significance of liberation over the so-called liberated man himself. 
The Reverend Dr. Matthew Johnson Sr. goes down this trail one step further. He reminds us that Onesimus, while at the very center of the letter and the struggle, is himself voiceless. He is truly a marginalized figure, a slave caught between the ethical and theological debates of two powerful men. But what hangs in the balance for Onesimus is not his theology. It is not his ethical or ideas or his policy. No, for Onesimus, what hangs in the balance is his very life, a life destined to either servitude, imprisonment, death, or perhaps freedom. Johnson makes the comparison that Onesimus represents all of those who are silenced by the powerful in a society. And he commends us as we come to the text of Philemon to work hard to not only hear the voice of Paul, but also to hear the voice of God. You see, throughout all of Scripture, God consistently aligns his voice with the voiceless. Consider the enslaved Israelites in the Old Testament or in the gospel, Jesus' interaction with the woman caught in adultery. So what is God trying to say to us through the letter of Philemon? I believe he is saying, hear the voice of the voiceless. Are you listening these days? They are calling for justice, ringing the alarm bells at the raging pandemic of racism that is raging in our nation. As we come to a close in our conversation of the cost of justice, I want to acknowledge that the cost for the oppressed is far more costly than that for the oppressor. oppressor. For Onesimus, it is to stand with hands open, staring at the bruises and the scars of past shackles, and to stand voiceless in the presence of his oppressor. I am grieved that some of you and some of us in our very community have to bear a burden like that. What must it be like to be black, Latino, native, queer, trans, disabled, undocumented, or spiritually wounded in the American church these days? What must it be like for you to be in our church? Your cost is so heavy, and it is high time that we bear it with you. And I want you to know, friends, that I am working hard in this season to untangle the ways in which my identity, specifically my ethnic identity, my gender, and my sexual identity, the ways that they have been hugely disproportionately woven into the fabric of how we do normal church in America. I am driven by a dream of revival, that God would reawaken the church, that his spirit would fall, and that we would, have, um, we would just be moved um, to seek him and to see greater things for the world. But I have to admit that this dream is taking on new meaning for me in this season. Philemon and Onesimus bear their respective costs. But there is one more in the story who bears a cost, and that is Paul. In verse 18, Paul is so convinced of the moral significance of restorative justice that he is willing to absorb the cost, any of the damage done by Onesimus, financial or otherwise, And here, Paul is truly embodying the way of the gospel and pointing back to Christ. For in the cosmic sense, as Peter in his second epistle or first epistle tells us, Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. Friends, We all have a cost to bear in the pursuit of justice. And though it is different for us all, we find our common ground in the reality that another has carried the cost of all of our injustices. It is my prayer this morning that you find strength to continue in doing good as you open your hands to the ultimate exemplar of justice in the person of Jesus. Amen. As we close, there will be a question for you to consider, and I wonder and invite you to wonder, what cost will you endure in our pursuit of justice?
This is a song that any person could sing in any moment in history, and it would be true. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Well, I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. Well, I am a child of God. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy until all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Well, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Well, I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Well, I am a child of God. Yes, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Well, I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. Split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and see. I am a child of God. Well, I am. A child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Well, I am a child of God. No, I'm no longer a slave to fear. Well, I am. A child of God. Well, I am a child of God.
When will the truth come out? When will your justice roll down? When will your kingdom come? And evil be undone? When will the wicked kneel? And the abused be healed? When will our sisters speak? Will no more shame or fear? So how long, how long? When will the daughters of Zion rejoice? the house of the Lord. Out of the miry clay, we will rise up someday. Sorrow won't always last. The dark will surely pass. Woe to the wicked one for what their hands have done. God is our righteous judge, and He will raise us up. Daughters of Zion rejoice in the house of the Lord. So let your justice roll down. Yeah, let your justice roll down. And yeah, let your justice roll down. Yeah, let your justice roll down. And yeah, let your justice roll down. Yeah, and let your justice roll down. And let your justice roll down. And let your justice roll down. I have the image that we are on a long distance run. Like, um, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, it's a long run. And my sense this morning and my hope this morning is that, and our hope for you this morning is that this was like one of those recharge stations where you can just grab a glass of water as you're running and just be refreshed. 
And maybe that sounds kind of odd or counterintuitive, but I just, I feel like this morning, part of reckoning, part of confronting truth, part of bringing things into the light is what it means to be on a process of being restored and staying in this for the long haul. It's just part of the race. It's part of the work. Some of you have been in it for a long time, and I just want to say it to you, to those of you that have been bearing the cost of justice, do not grow weary. In another place, Paul wrote to the letter uh, to the Galatians, he said, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And so that's my prayer for you, that's my prayer for us this morning, that we will not give up. This is the beginning or the continuation of a long lifetime commitment to working out the kingdom and the fullness of its justice on earth as it is in heaven. So let me pray this blessing over you. I bless you in the name of Jesus for all the parts of you that have grown weary. May the Lord in his touch restore hope in you today. And I pray uh, an invitation from the Lord to be strengthened for the long haul of following Jesus and his plans and purposes in this world. So may you be refreshed. May you be um, encouraged to step out another day and do not grow weary of doing good. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us um, today, and we look forward to seeing you again. Have an incredible week. Take care.